Welcome to this week's episode of Free Your Inner Guru. I'm your host, Laura Tucker. Everything you need is inside of you. I want you to know the joy of becoming your own sovereign, regardless of your circumstances. In this episode, we'll explore what self-sovereignty means and why claiming your personal authority brings greater and greater levels of happiness into your life. I know you're probably listening to this podcast on the go, so what I've done is create Become Your Own Sovereign, a free downloadable which is going to help you apply everything I'm sharing with you in a practical way. The downloadable includes a nine-step process to define your why, two ways to identify where you're giving your energy away, two tools to reclaim your power, five ways you can connect to your inner guru, and an action plan so that you can apply your wisdom. Before you forget, go ahead and get your free downloadable at lauratucker.com slash ebook. Now, on to our episode. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been refining the identity and the big why behind this podcast. If you take a trip on over to the freeyourinnerguru.com website, you'll see there's been quite a few changes. The essence behind the podcast has always been the same, but it's getting clearer and clearer. Everything you need is inside of you. Your job is to find it and bring it into the world. When you free your inner guru by connecting to your inner voice and your intuition, you become the conscious leader you want to see in the world. But before you can become a conscious leader of others, you must be a conscious leader of yourself. If we're going to talk about consciousness, leadership, and self-sovereignty, there's three factors that are interrelated that we need to explore. Self-control, how a person perceives their sense of control, and happiness. I went out on the internet to gather some backup for my ideas. Initially, I was looking to support my experience that the more I perceived control over my situation to be internal, the happier I am. In psychology, this is called having an internal locus of control. There is some evidence to support a causal relationship between an internal locus of control and happiness, But there is a third element of the equation that is even more powerful, self-control. I found a 2015 study called The Relationship Between Happiness, Self-Control, and Locus of Control. If reading psychology um, reports and articles and white papers are your thing, I've put a link in the show notes for you. The subjects of the study were Iranian school teachers. The researchers found that self-control is positively and significantly related to happiness. It wasn't so straightforward when it came to whether a person had an internal or external locus of control. According to the study, living a more satisfying and happy life is directly dependent on how accurate our locus of control is. Through exerting effort on doing, we gain power and conclude that our happiness and well-being is maximized in its best way. People who have an internal locus of control believe that they are responsible for their own behaviors and the results based on their own personal decisions and efforts. Having an internal locus of control produces a can-do attitude. That is, people with internal locus of control do not spend time bemoaning for the fact that something has happened to them. In other words, When it comes to locus of control, whether control is perceived to be internal or external to the individual was a factor, but even more so, the accuracy of how the locus of control is perceived is more significant. I'll come back to this finding later in the podcast. Agency is the capacity of individuals to act independently and make their own free choices. If a person has a strong sense of agency, they feel a sense of influence and control. If that agency is somehow taken away by another person or by circumstances, the effect is disempowering. Often, the one taking away our own agency is ourselves. If you've been in a situation or relationship where you've given your power away, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. 
The process of reclaiming your personal power and becoming self-determined requires stripping everything away right down to your core. This is not easy work. It can be shocking to wake up to your inner self. Many people, myself included, are shown the vast distance between who they want to be and who they really are and how they're operating by tragedy or trauma. I've come to believe that the reason that certain events achieve traumatic status is because of the size of that gap. Tragedy and trauma makes us face our mortality. It can show us how far away we are from being our true selves, if even for a moment. For me, part of the journey back involved a new understanding of personal responsibility. Above all, conscious leaders take personal responsibility. There's a difference between the legal definition and the spiritual definition of personal responsibility. In the traditional um, and legal view of personal responsibility, personal responsibility or individual responsibility is the idea that human beings choose, instigate, or otherwise cause their own actions. A related idea is that because we cause our own actions, we can be held morally accountable or legally liable. In the spiritual view of personal responsibility, you are at cause for all of your actions and all of your results. You are also at cause for collective results. For many people, this idea has been framed as the law of attraction. Think good things and good things happen. Think bad things and bad things happen. And for many people, it works until they are called to go deeper and the results force them to take a look at themselves. If you are at cause for all of your actions and all of your results, and you are also at cause for collective results, what happens when things go horribly wrong and undesirable results happen? In many instances, the world is your mirror showing you parts of yourself. Look at the state of global leadership today. Is it showing you that you need to become a better leader? Look at what is being revealed about people of privilege and power. Is it showing you that you need to claim your voice? I'm not suggesting that every single thing that's challenging about the world we live in is about you or is your responsibility. But I'm also not recommending that you stay passive until you are thrown into a state of extreme discord in your life. If anything, I'm here to encourage you to get on this journey before that happens. And the way that you can do that is to start taking responsibility. It just so happens that one of the key core characteristics of conscious leaders is their ability to take personal responsibility. Taking personal responsibility means that you examine what you are at cause for in your life. Now, there are different ways to look at this. And there are different consequences. I've come to call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is the perceived sense of control when you take responsibility. You're assigning responsibility within. Your locus of control is within. The bad is when people designate all responsibility to outside of themselves or to only the realm of thought, leading to what can only be described as extreme negative thinking on one end of the spectrum or magical thinking on the other end of the spectrum where it's all thought and no action. The ugly aspect of personal responsibility is that it can be overdone. When someone takes over responsibility, they become completely disempowered. They blame themselves for everything and they shame themselves. The study I was referring to earlier makes this make sense. If your perception of where responsibility lies is accurate, your ability to discern where you have influence from where things are out of your control is also more accurate. There's a few questions you can ask yourself. Like, where is the locus of control on this anyways? Or, where is the responsibility? How much of it is on me? Take responsibility for that. Learn to know what you can influence instead of trying to control everything, and then leave the rest. The more conscious you become, the stronger your power of discernment becomes. 
In other words, you learn what to take responsibility for and what to let go. This is the journey of self-sovereignty. So what does self-sovereignty mean? A sovereign is a person who has supreme power or authority. The term self-sovereign was first used in a book by William Rees Mogg and James Dale called The Sovereign Individual. At the core of the concept is a shift in how you see the world. To be your own sovereign doesn't mean you have to buy an island, set up offshore banking, and set up your own republic. You are the republic and its authority. Becoming your own authority means becoming sovereign in your consciousness and not going along with things, including your own thoughts that are harmful to you. Becoming sovereign in your consciousness is the shift. It's the recognition that in any circumstance, you are your own authority. You have the power and responsibility to discern what is good and right for you. Every human being's responsibility is to themselves, and that's how we come into sovereignty. Well, this sounds like something that you might like and share on social media or put on a mug or a t-shirt. There is a flip side. It is also the recognition that if every human being's responsibility is to themselves, every other person is also their own authority. If every human's responsibility is to themselves, then everyone's agenda and code of conduct has the potential to be in alignment with yours or to be at cross purposes. Every party in every relationship should be making decisions based on what is true and right for them. Even when it seems that you're in alignment, the agenda, the why, the consciousness behind it can be totally different. So what does this mean? It means you have to learn to discern. You let your mind, your conscious mind, do its job, which is to sort through information, ask questions, get all the facts, pay attention to the answers, listen for more than what you want to hear, and learn to rely on multiple sources of discernment, especially your intuition otherwise known as your inner voice, otherwise known as your inner guru. You have to go inside, get real inside of yourself and ask what is real, what matters, and what is important. And then ask yourself, regardless of that, what does my heart tell me? Your consciousness is not seated in your brain. It's seated in your heart. The inner guru of the heart occurs differently for everyone, but one thing is for certain, it doesn't communicate to us through our busy brain. I find it helpful to think of the heart as a metaphor for how my higher self speaks to me through my body. Intuition speaks differently to each and every one of us. For some, it is like a literal pulling on your heart. For others, it's a yes or no gut response or a lightning fast survival instinct. Others still need to find emotional clarity before knowing their truth. It takes practice and paying attention to how you feel when you make a decision and how it unfolds, when it unfolds for your highest good, and even more importantly, when it doesn't. The key to learning and practicing over time is paying attention to what your results tell you. The most predictable way to get a pulse on how connected you are to your inner guru is to take an objective look at your results or have someone else help you take an objective look at your results. If you are self-directed, have clarity of purpose, and are embodying your true self, it will show in your results and how you feel on a day-to-day basis. Similarly, if you are at the whim of circumstance and the agenda of others, it will show in your results and how you also feel on a day-to-day basis. There are so many causes of disconnection from your inner wisdom, especially in our society. We come disconnected from the wisdom of our heart. There's conditioning whether it's generational or from your own childhood, tragedy and trauma, as I mentioned earlier, 
betrayal by authority figures or someone that we trust, unhealthy codependent negative relationships, distractions, diversion, technology, shiny objects. We numb through alcohol, drugs, and sugar. We have a habit of busyness. We spend money unconsciously. We're addicted to the news. We fall prey to comparison and false urgency driven by the urge to keep up with everyone else. Fear of missing out, otherwise known as FOMO, is rampant and it keeps you always feeling like you are not enough. Basically, anything that keeps you distracted, unclear, and expending energy on things you cannot control disconnects you from the wisdom of your inner guru. We live in a time of abundant distraction. Technology has brought enhancements to our lives, but the distraction of 24-7 access to information, be it the news or what others are curating about their lives, has reached toxic levels. Just today, I read an article about a new paper uh, released in Clinical Psychological Science. The sudden ascendance of the smartphone is being linked to a dramatic rise in the rates of teenage depression and suicide. The authors of the study propose that it's not necessarily the smartphone itself, but time that could be spent on more meaningful activities. Now, if there is anything to take responsibility for as adults with our fully more mature and developed brains, shouldn't we be taking responsibility for that? To be truly effective, we must take responsibility for ourselves And the way to do that is to reconnect with our inner guru. I put together a a list initially for this episode, and then it started to develop into something much bigger. And it's become this download that you can come on over to the show notes and uh, find the link. And I'll mention it a bit later. But I'm going to give you an overview here so that you can do this in your mind and let it seep in while you're listening. The first way to reconnect with your inner guru and with your wisdom is to define your why. If you know who you want to become, what you want to do, and what you want to have, and I don't necessarily mean things, it can be experiences. When you know your reason for being, it helps you to let go of these two things. Number one, what other people think. Number two, trying to control everything. A sense of perceived control over your own life is a part of self-sovereignty, as I was saying earlier. But we have to stop trying to control everything and everybody around us. We have to stop trying to control what others think through justifying and explaining. And we have to stop trying to control how and when everything in our lives is going to unfold. You need to understand the difference between control and influence. Control is tight, gripping, tense, stressful, and manipulative. Influence is loose, attentive, patient, strategic, and self-directed. Control limits results, while influence creates them. People can feel when you are being controlling, and we all do it, and we have to stop it. When you start to explore the difference between control and influence, it's also important to audit where you are being controlled and where you are being influenced. And two ways to do that is to look at your distractions and your tolerations. Distractions are what you think they are. They're enticements that show up. There are Facebook feeds. There are shiny new objects that I was referring to earlier. And what you can do is ask yourself, is this a distraction? Or is this a part of the bigger plan? And remember that what you say no to is at least as important as what you say yes to. There's all kinds of influences vying for energy and attention. And if one of those influences is another person, how they feel about how you answer or respond to their request or invitation has nothing to do with you. Remember, their responsibility is to themselves. It's also important to remember that doing nothing is still something. If you don't have clarity, it's perfectly great for you to give yourself permission to take a step back. 
The point of connection with your higher self is through your heart. And sometimes it takes a little while to get clear on what your heart is trying to say to you. Think your thoughts, but then ask yourself, regardless of all that, what does my heart tell me? And then use your voice to express your point of view. When you use your voice, there are going to be people who don't like it. They like the way things are. They're a part of the status quo. Their agenda and values are likely very different from yours. They'll find your energy confronting. They want to keep you average because it's easier for them. And it's uncomfortable as hell. Is this discomfort real? Yes. Does it matter? Not really. Not at least when compared to the hell that is being untrue to yourself. Is it important? Yes, it's important enough to become resilient to it. Otherwise, you become subservient to what is average. What is meaningful in our lives? What is fulfilling? Let's discern that. And then use the magnificent energy of your resilience there. The journey of self-sovereignty is not for the faint of heart. It's for the strong of heart. We don't just suddenly have a moment where we know where we have to look inside and then that's it. The more clarity you have, the more you practice discernment, the more you use your voice, the easier it gets. When you embody your consciousness and become self-sovereign, you learn to march to the beat of your own heart. Life becomes joyful as you connect to your wisdom within. You are invited to take your next step in your self-sovereignty journey. In the show notes, you will find a link to download the brand new ebook, Become Your Own Sovereign. I'm super excited to be able to offer you this free download. This interactive ebook contains four sections, nine questions to define your why, distractions and tolerations, what they are, how to identify them so you can reclaim your power, the self-care connection with five ways you can connect to your inner guru and taking action, an action plan so that you can apply your wisdom. Come on over to lauratucker.com slash ebook or follow the link in the show notes. Once you've downloaded your ebook, you'll receive an invitation to the Free Your Inner Guru Facebook group where you can join our conversation online. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I know you have a lot of choice where you receive your inspiration and information. If these ideas and stories resonate with you, I'd be grateful if you would take a few extra seconds for two quick things. One, if there's an idea or story that you know would make a difference in someone else's life, follow the link in the show notes back to our website where you can easily share it with them. And two, subscribe so that you can be a part of the ongoing conversation on whatever app or website you are listening on. Big conversations become the catalyst for meaningful change. And if you happen to be listening on iTunes, please take a few moments to leave a rating and review. I'm Laura Tucker, signing off for this week's Free Your Inner Guru.